Okay, so section three. We need to get through all of section three and section four, but section four is real little, so. But we got a lot to do today, so stick with me. All right, so we're gonna talk about the Crusades. Now, when you hear about the Crusades um, in like a history setting of any sort, if it's on the History Channel, if your next year's history teacher mentions the cr Crusades, they're almost always referring to these Crusades that we're gonna talk about. However, Crusades in general, there's been hundreds of different types of Crusades, but these ones in particular are focused on taking over the Holy Land. The Holy Land is in Jerusalem, but let's do some review, okay? So, Crusades, you guys remember what Crusades stands for? It means Holy War. Just learned that last um, section. Holy War. So this is incited by the popes of the RCC, and these people are wanting to take over the Holy Land. What's the Holy Land again? Jerusalem. I don't know if I spelled that right, but you got it, okay? Holy Land in Jerusalem, that's when we talked about um, two units ago, when we talked about uh, the different types of religions, okay? Several types of different religions claim the Holy Land, or Jerusalem as the Holy Land, okay? So their whole point, though, is to take that over. Um, the RCC wants to own it for religious purposes, but also for money purposes, too, because Jerusalem was a hub or a center of trade. Um, it's centered right in the end of the Mediterranean Sea, so you've got people from Europe that would come and trade, you've got people from Africa coming up and trading, and of course people from the Middle East and even Asia. Um, the spice route from India is going to come in through there too, and the really rich people love these different spices and love the different types of cloth and material they could get um, out of India and Asia. So, um, owning Jerusalem was more for money than for religious purposes. But, of course, there are religious purposes there because of um, the different things that are claimed to have happened there in Jerusalem. Okay, so the very first um, major crusade we're going to talk about right now. It first starts with a guy named Alexius I. He's an emperor of the Byzantine Empire. Byzantine Empire. This is really where... Um, uh, Turkey is today, if you remember where Turkey is on the map that we've been working with, okay? So Alexius, he, um, he's noticed that there's more and more Muslims coming into his territory, which he is a devout Catholic, which means he doesn't believe in Islam or the Muslim religion, okay? So he needs some help to get these people out of his country. So he asks the Pope at the time, who was Urban II, and if you remember the other day when we wrote on our chart, we had Urban II, and I was like, you know, we haven't talked about him yet, but we're going to talk about him. This is it, okay? So Urban II, he's your Pope. He hears about this issue, and he thinks, okay, let's do this. Um, not only can he help Alexius push out the Muslims there, he'll go on into Jerusalem and try to take it over. So there's a couple of different incentives here for him. So at the Council of Claremont, you'll need to know this. There's a question on it on your test in a couple of weeks. You'll need to know who Urban II is, too. <clears throat> Council of Claremont. This is just where he gets together and he asks or urges people, any followers of the RCC, to come and join the crusading army. So what does he do to get people to join? Well, he gives some incentives. He says, if you die in the crusade, you'll die and go to heaven. Straight up go to heaven. If you're on your way over there, you die, you go to heaven, but especially in the battling, okay? Then, um, he also promises land, money, if you return, okay? Now think about this for a second. If a pope is promising some of this stuff, do you think he's really going to come through with it? Well, most people don't even make it home. Think about the time. You have to travel by foot or by horse all across Europe to get to Jerusalem to fight anyway. So when these people are traveling, they have to deal with um, hunger issues. You gotta make sure they can trade. They gotta have money, first of all, to even go. They also um, have to avoid disease. Disease was rampant. So if they could avoid all those and get to Jerusalem to actually fight, then they have to survive the battle of fighting, okay? If they do all that and start on their way home, they have to make it through all those issues again on the way home. They could even be robbed by pirates. Who knows, okay? So if they could make it home, most of the time, your popes or your kings, who also um, would provide some incentives for you to go, they wouldn't come through with it a lot of times. 
Or they'd say, well, we need proof that you even went. Well, who has proof that you went? They don't do documentation like that back then. So most likely, if you did make it all the way back home, you're not going to get anything. Well, when word came out from that after the next few crusades, a lot of people, if they won or lost at, at, at the crusades, they just go and live somewhere else. They wouldn't go back because they know they're not going to have anything when they get back anyway. Okay? All right. So, Council of Claremont, First Crusade. Um, Alexius I needed help. He asks for Urban II to help him. It, it happened. So let's talk about the four main crusades. The first one, whenever they go to fight, it's a complete slaughter of the Muslims. So we're going to put this down as a Christian victory. Now let's look at this word a little bit here. Christian victory. Slaughter. Let's look at this word slaughter. Now think about that word slaughter. Now if you're going to take a pig or a cow and you're going to go slaughter them, you're not just going to kill them. You're going to kill them and then you're going to butcher them. Right? That's what this word slaughter is. It's not only a, a word about how they won, but it's a word on how, what they did to the people as they were killing them. They cut them up. Okay? They dismembered them. There was body parts all over. They decapitated them, put their heads on pikes. Pretty grotesque. Okay? So, why do they do that? Two reasons. One is to show and send a message to the rest of the world. Don't mess with these people. They're going to kill you. They're going to hurt you. Okay? Second reason. It's more of a... Um, uh, what's the word? When you want to... Um, I don't know. Dishonor them, I guess. When you bury somebody, if it's a you know, dearly loved family member, you want all their body parts. You, you want a whole body to bury the whole thing, and it's just a kind of a closure, right? Okay, when they dismember them, that's dishonoring them. The family's going to have to find a leg over here, an arm over here, a torso over like, They're not going to be able to do it. So these people can't even bury their loved ones in an honorable fas fashion. So, two reasons why they did it. Wasn't very good. They're, you know, sending this horrible message. But... It worked, apparently. Look at the years. First Crusade, Major Crusade, in 1099. Now, we're going to go to 1187. Almost 100 years pass before anything is done about these Christians who take over Jerusalem. So, second Major Crusade. you got a new leader of the Muslims. His name is Saladin or Saladin. Okay? He's actually a pretty good leader. He um, has a lot of followers. And whenever he... Um, gets his grouping of, of crusaders to go in to take over the Holy Land for the Muslim religion, when he goes and fights, he ash, actually asks his people not to slaughter them like the previous Christians did to their people. Mainly because he knows what that was like. He'd heard stories about this, how the, their loved ones couldn't you know, be buried properly. So he didn't want that to happen, which is pretty notable, honorable really, okay? He kicks butt. He kicks the Christians out. So now we've got a Muslim victory. All right, when Saladin actually takes over, he doesn't have a closed door policy within Jerusalem. The medieval walls are pretty much open to anyone who wants to come in, obviously as long as they're going to be peaceful, okay? He allows Christians to come in and live. He allows uh, Jews to come in and live. Of course, Muslims, because that's what he is. But he doesn't say no, that only Muslims can he live here. He notices, he realizes that this is a holy place for multiple religions. So he allows other people to come in. Eventually, he does have to shut down um, the doors to the medieval walls and have to ask for permission to come in and out because there's crusaders who try to come and take it over, all right? Um, so you have some small little miniature crusades in between here. But that was a huge slaughter. Now, later on next week, we're going to watch a movie called um, Kingdom of Heaven. And it's a long movie. Not sure if we'll get through it all, but it talks about the Second Crusade. You'll recognize this um, leader here, Saladin. So just keep that in mind if you behave. Okay, next one, Third Crusade. This is what we're going to call the Dream Crusade. Dream Crusade, okay? Why is it called the Dream Crusade? We've got three major European powerhouses that combine together their armies. So, you got Richard the Lionhearted of England, 
You got Philip II of France. You remember him? We talked about him. And you got Frederick Barbosa of the HRE. All right. These leaders help incite people to come with him. So you've got them, their, their leaders, their nobles, all their knights, and any peasants who want to join. So they have this huge powerhouse army on the way to Jerusalem. It looks super intimidating, except a few little mishaps happen along the way. Now, I can't remember off the top of my head which one had their, their little issue, but just go with me here. If I'm wrong, correct me later. But pretty sure it's Philip II, who right before they're getting ready to attack, he's got all of his armor on, he's ready to go. They have to cross a river first before they can get in to attack, right? Falls off his horse and drowns. That's what happened to him. Falls off his horse and drowns, right? Okay. All right, next guy, Frederick Barbosa. They're on their way over there, and he gets a really bad case of dysentery. Do you guys know what dysentery is? Let me tell you. It's really, 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 really bad case of diarrhea. And he dies. He poops himself to death. That's what it comes down to. Okay? So, those guys are out. Now, remember what I told you before? Whenever your leader dies, what happens to your army? They disperse, right? They leave. Now, some may stay and some do stay because you still have this leader. You got Richard the Lionhearted of England, okay? They go, they fight, but they're only about a third down to what they used to have. So they don't have this huge big army anymore. It's a fail for the Christians. So here you'll put a Muslim victory. Okay? Now, stories aren't over yet. Richard the Lionhearted on his way home. Back to England. Gets captured. Not killed, though. And he actually is given up for a nice fat ransom. Lots of money was given for him. English people got him back. All right, next one. Fourth Crusade. This was just a total disaster. It shouldn't have even happened. But um, a bunch of people tried to get together, but it wasn't well organized. They have people from all over Europe, which they've had before, but you also had leaders to do it. This one was just a bunch of um, knights and peasants who were like, look, you know, probably got drunk in a tavern one night, decided this is what they're going to do, okay? But they don't have much money. The RCC at this point doesn't have much money because of all these other things going on previously. Um, they had to borrow money even from Italy to um, get boats. And they thought maybe if we went through the Mediterranean up into the Middle East, that that would be kind of a, like a surprise attack. Storms in the ocean dispersed those, okay? The people who went by land, they got to Constantinople, which is in the Byzantine Empire where Turkey is. They got into arguments about stupid stuff and started fighting and killing each other. So the people who survived that or survived the boats, they met up in, or survived the ocean, they met up in um, Jerusalem, but there's not much left of that army. Total failure. So once again, Muslim victory. All right, so that's kind of it in a nutshell. So whenever historians talk about the Crusades, these are the main Crusades. Now, there is another crusade called the Children's Crusade that happened. That isn't really on our list, but it's still kind of important. But there's a pope. Yeah, let me back up. It's called the Children's Crusade. Think about that. Okay, so there is a pope who decided it was a good idea to get a huge army of children and send them over to Jerusalem. Yeah, so they trained some children, um, anywhere between about 8 to 12, trained them to fight, and then they sent them on their way. But they were malnourished, they were, um, you know, uh, traveling, exhausted, uh, they got diseases, all that stuff. By the time they actually made it, there are very few left, and those poor children really just wanted some, some love and somebody to take care of them. So they were just accepted into the, the community. But what they were supposed to do, supposedly, between, for this pope, was to have this massive cru uh, crusade of children go into there. Like, you know, what person's going to give or tell children to go away? Like, no, you can't come to my city. Like, they're going to accept these children. And, and then they're supposed to, like, you know, 
turn around and stab them in the back, shank, shank from the kids, right? But that doesn't happen. So most of them die anyway. And it was just a, a total disaster. So there's also that one. But like I said, lots of different types of crusades. But anytime you hear this word crusade, it's usually talking about this time period, all right? Okay, mentioned all of this already. I just did it in a shortened version. Though, find this, it's worded just a little bit differently, but find this where it says Muslims had control of Jerusalem for several years from 1291 up for a couple hundred years. Later on, Christians take it over. Later on after that, the Jewish people take it over. Okay? Okay, so what comes out of the Crusades? The biggest impacts. Well, what do you need to know? All of this from your notes. So let's talk about some of these. First of all, all of this will be on your test. You don't have to know this word for word, but there's a couple of what I call connection questions. Those are like the eight, 10 point questions on your test. Well, you'll need to recognize that this, these are effects or impacts of the crusade. Monday, we'll do our worksheet on the crusades, that extra worksheet that's supposed to be in our packet, your Google assignment packet that no one probably even doing, but we're gonna do that extra worksheet in class Monday, okay? So, <clears throat> all right, so we have some natural things that occur. You've got an increase in trade. That, that comes naturally. When you have lots of people traveling around, you've got to um, buy your food sometimes, buy supplies, buy a new horse maybe, whatever, okay? Um, so that's natural for uh, trade to increase. But you also have an increase of power to the church and power to the monarchs. That's what I'm talking about when they were trying to get people to join the church, to join the crusades. They would... Um, suggest that they uh, would d go straight to heaven when they died, if they died in the war, um, give them money or land or whatever upon their return, all right? So this increased their power because they have lots of people coming and following them, paying their tithe, you know, that 10%, it was still a thing, okay? All right, also, the use of money, like actual tangible coins, not usually paper money, but coins is going to increase, and an end to serfdom temporarily. Remember we talked about Louis IX, how he, the most famous thing he was known for was ending serfdom, which is a great thing. But remember his nickname was Saint Louis, and he was super religious? Well, the reason him, um, for him to end serfdom was that he wanted his now peasants to join up the cause of the Crusades and go fight. Um, let's see here. Also, wider worldview. This is a good thing. Um, whenever you travel, you're going to experience new people, new cultures, new food, all sorts of stuff, right? So this just expands your world. You know, most people back then, they didn't realize there was much more to where they lived, the little castle manor that they lived on, the farms that they lived on. They didn't realize that there's a bigger city and even a country that they lived in or other countries or even other parts of the world, okay? So when you do expand uh, travel naturally, you just learn new things and it naturally expands your world view. Which yes, there's a typo here. Marco Polo went all the way <laughs> to China. So yeah, Marco Polo was an actual person. It wasn't just, you know, a pool game. Marco. Hello. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's see. He was one that, um, th this is another thing that happened, is that when people would go on these crusades, sometimes they just use it as a free ride to get out of town. Oh, I'm going to go on the crusade, and then they hop ship later on, maybe stay in the Byzantine Empire, maybe stay in Jerusalem, maybe move on to uh, Asia somewhere, okay? All right, next part of our notes. Okay, this is called the Reconquista, but it's Spanish, so you got to say Reconquista, right? Okay, what does it mean, reconquering of Spain? Reconquering of Spain. Well, this is really a religious conquering. So what this is, is that the RCC wants the people of Spain to reconquer it for the name of Christianity, okay? So, um... Overall, Spain had um, a pretty large population of Muslim followers, and that was okay. 
uh, Spain was open to have different um, religions. But as more power came to the church and some of the leaders in Spain, because Spain wasn't really quite the full nation of Spain yet until this wedding down here happens, okay? So the different states within um, Spain became more Catholic. Then they decided that they don't want anybody else but Catholics. So, let me explain a little bit more. There is a marriage that happened between a guy named Ferdinand and a girl named Isabella. Isabella was from a place or state called Castile, and Ferdinand was from a state called Aragon. When they married, um, they combined their states, which created the country of Spain like we know it today. And look at the time period, the year 1492. Oh, does that remind you of anything? 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. Okay, this is the time period we're talking about, all right? <clears throat> and they're the ones that actually send Columbus on his way. We'll get to that in a minute. Okay, so they're going to create the, the country of Spain like we know it today. Both are very devout Christians, Catholics, They're, they want to follow the church, they want to do what the Pope asks them to do, and what's been asked of them is to kick out anybody that is not Catholic. So, they even go so far as creating the Inquisition. You need to know this. We'll talk about the Inquisition the rest of the school year, okay? Inquisition, it's a church court set up to try heretics. Well, what's a heretic? We learned this two units ago when we are talking about all the religious stuff. Heretic. These are people that are against the RCC. Well, what's that mean exactly? Against the RCC. Sometimes there are people deliberately against it. If you're Muslim, you're against the RCC. If you're Jewish, you're against the RCC. There are still Christians who are against the RCC in some way. Uh, say maybe there is something that the Pope asked them to do that they don't think is true, that they don't need to do they don't want to do it, then they would be considered a heretic, okay? If anyone in this classroom right now is not Catholic, you're considered a heretic, okay? Now, I'm not calling you a heretic. I'm just saying from the viewpoint of the RCC, that's how they would look at it, all right? Now, they don't think that necessarily today, but, you know, that's another story. Okay, so if you're not a devout Catholic, 100%, you know, took in the Kool-Aid, then... You're considered a heretic. All right, now, I'm going to refer to Isabella as Crazy Izzy. Now, why do I call her that? That's just my name for her, Crazy Izzy, because she is cray cray, okay? First of all, she likes to kill people. She likes to kill anyone who is a heretic. And not only just kill them, she likes to watch them suffer. She actually created a bunch of torture devices, and we'll see some of those on Monday, all right? Um, another reason why I call her Crazy Izzy. Oh, by the way, here's their mug shots here, right? Yes, this is a book cover, but these are their um, portraits. And of course, for the time period, this is the best looking ones they thought were cool, right? They look a little funny. Just go with it, okay? All right, why do I call her Crazy Izzy? Well, first off, like I told you, she loved to kill people, but not only kill them, but kill them in grotesque ways like I put up here, okay? But another reason why I call her crazy is for the time, she was crazy enough to send Columbus on his journey. Now, why is that a crazy thing? Well, people back then thought the earth was flat. Do you remember this? The church actually taught people that the earth was flat. So if you didn't think the earth was flat, you're considered a heretic according to the RCC. Just simple things like that, okay? So she didn't think, I mean, she still thought that the earth was flat, but she took Columbus for his word as in he thought he really could find an all-water route to India. India is where the spices and the cloth and all that kind of fun stuff is that all the rich people really like, okay? Plus, if he discovered anything on his way, it would make Crazy Izzy and Ferdinand super rich. Think about that for a second. Spain isn't a super rich country compared to the other ones we've talked about so far, but they want to be rich, okay? So when they send Columbus on his way, lo and behold, he found a whole other continent on the other side of the world, right? So you got North and South America. If you think about it, from Mexico down, Mexico, Latin America, South America, all those places speak what? Spanish. 
Where does that come from? It comes from Spain because Crazy Izzy and Ferdinand owned that land for a lot of time and they had everyone speak Spanish. People settled over there and they spoke Spanish, okay? There's only one small area that doesn't speak Spanish and that's called uh, Brazil. Brazil, it was owned by Portugal. So what do they speak? Portuguese, okay? All right, so we'll talk more about Columbus in another time, but these are the reasons why I call her Crazy Izzy. For the time, she was crazy to send Columbus on his way, but it paid off for her, and she was super crazy for this whole killing people. Okay, section four. Stay with me. We're almost done. All right. Um... So we're going to switch our thinking just a little bit. We're going to talk about what people were learning at the time, what the literature was, art, architecture, all that kind of stuff. Okay, the social part of Europe going on. All right, this word, scholasticism. You should try to say it. It's fun. Ready? Scholasticism. Big fancy word. Now, you can say scholastic, you know, when you did your uh, book fair stuff, right? But scholarly is what it comes from, scholasticism. Now, what is it? Using reason to support Christian beliefs. Using reason or science. Oh, man, that looks bad. Science. I'm supposed to say science. There we go. Okay. Um, now, science is nowhere near where it is today at this point. Okay, we're going to talk next chapter about the whole scientific revolution. But it's just really asking you to use thought, a thought process when you're dealing with anything, really. But to use reason to support Christian beliefs. Now, at first, the RCC is like, yeah, this is a good idea. Use whatever you can to support your beliefs. That sounds great. Until people started being educated, still they, until they started learning how to read and write in their own language, vernacular, your own language, everyday language. So if you're English, your vernacular is English. If you're Spanish, your vernacular is Spanish. If you're from France, your vernacular is French, and so on. You get this, okay? So, if you learn to read and write in your own language, and then you have to learn how to read and write in Latin, that's what the Bible was written in. That's what any type of textbook or your ancient philosophers like uh, Aristotle in them, it was all in Latin. So if you're gonna educate yourself, you've gotta learn Latin. Once people started learning Latin, and studying the Bible. Now they did that for faith. They would study the Bible. The, the scriptures do ask for you to pray daily and to read the scriptures daily as best you can, right? So once they were doing that for religious purposes, that's when they found out that the Pope, or whoever the Pope was throughout the years, were making up crap as they were going. Now the Pope and stuff were educated people. They read the Bible, they knew what was in there, but they knew no one else could, for the most part. And so they could make up whatever they wanted and tell the people that and saying, oh yeah, it's in the Bible for you to do this. It's in the Bible for you to go on crusades. It's in the Bible for you to die for the cause of the crusades. It's in the Bible for you to buy this piece of paper that says you're going to go to heaven. We'll get to that another time. All right, so when people started learning and using this idea of scholasticism, then the church says, no, 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 we, we're not going to do scholasticism anymore. That, that's going to be, that's a heresy thing. You're going to be a heretic if you practice scholasticism. So at first they liked it and promoted it until it started being used against them. All right, literature during the time. You've got Divine Comedy by Dante, Can Canterbury Tales by Chaucer. If you haven't yet, you will soon get to this in your English classes. Um, illumination down here. This is those big fancy, you've seen this before, okay? But it's those big fancy letters, like, I don't know, like a, like a big old fancy S that's like, woo, doo doo doo. That's all like this, right? And then it says the rest of the word, I don't know, uh, we'll say school, I don't know. <laughs> okay? So, so it's got the big old, you, you know, you've seen these before. So that's what that's called. And it's all handwritten, you know, hand designs. So it's really interesting to see and, and really neat for people to be able to do that. Again, you don't have any type of printing um, machine, a copying machine, a printing press or anything like that, so everything was still handwritten. This was just the popular design for the time. And then tiny down here, you got some architectural types, Romanesque and Gothic. Romanesque and Gothic. Now what does that look like? Let me show you some pictures here. 
you've seen this, you've seen this, you know what this is. You got this kind of dark, steep, very steep, um, uh, pointy type of architecture. But you still have Romanesque. Esque is like ish, Roman-ish, right? Roman time periods had lots of pillars and arches, circles, like up here you got a circle over here, arches, but then it's still, you've got the, the pointy thing. They also used gargoyles during this time. You know, and they'd actually put them at the edge, like, of their, um, their, uh, oh, what's it called? Water runs through it. Um, uh, my goodness, what can I think? The guttering system. When it goes through the guttering system, and then the gargoyles will be at the end, and this, the water goes through their mouth at the end. That looks pretty crazy, right? Okay, so they used even stained glass for this time. Now, glass period was expensive, but stained glass even more expensive, okay? But with the images they would paint in the stained glass, um, they were dark images of like hell, burning, the devil, things like that, because the church wanted to manipulate you and, and scare you into believing and, and converting to Catholicism. So they would have these really scary um, uh, stained glass images all throughout the church and most people when they attended couldn't read anyway. Even if you're a nobleman, if you're a rich person, you didn't read it, right? Because you didn't have any purpose for it. Of course, if you're a peasant or serf, you don't have any purpose for it. But when you attend church and, and you're there and you see these very scary images, it does kind of, you know, develop this kind of fear within you. Like if the this priest and the and the uh, pope are saying these things, and now we see these images, maybe it's all true. Okay, so they would use those types of things to help manipulate people into um, converting to Catholicism. Okay, that should be it. <laughs>